Now, I know that there's no way to do an accurate survey on this, but I would wager to say that the most suppressed fear of the human race is the fear of death. A lot of people will say, I'm not afraid to die, to which I usually respond, I see you're also not afraid to lie. Death is not natural. Thank you for laughing, Dave. That was a joke, by the way. Death is not natural. Okay, we say that it is, but it's not. Here's a thought exercise. Think about not existing. Can you think about not existing? You can't. You can't think about that. It's impossible. Because you were made to live. You were made for life. And anything that's not life, you can't comprehend. So when we're faced with the prospect of death, it strikes fear into our hearts. It evokes hopelessness. But we need hope. That's what we need. Hope that is greater than death. That's what we're searching for. That's what we're grasping for. All of us, whether you admit it or not, whether you're doing it intentionally or you're doing it on the subconscious level, that's what you're searching for. Now, the good news is we have that hope. We literally have it in Jesus Christ. And as Ben said this morning before service, he said the answer is always Jesus. And it really is. It really is. A lot of people see Jesus as just some religious thing, concept or something. No, no. He, he tells us, and in the passage we'll read this morning, he tells us he is the resurrection and the life. And some of my friends say, well, Jesus just isn't for me. Jesus just says, I'm glad it's nice for you and it gets you through the day, but Jesus just isn't for me. Like he's some kind of option or something at the Chinese food buffet. No, 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 no. If Jesus isn't for you, then you know what is for you? (laughs) Death. (laughs) Yeah, hell too. Yeah. Because he's the resurrection and the life. He is the resurrection. He is the life. He is our only and our greatest hope. And he doesn't, sorry, he does this, he doesn't, no, he does this by raising Lazarus, a man who was dead for four days out of his tomb. And how does he do it? How does he do it? He does it with his voice. So everything Jesus did in his earthly ministry illustrated with great power his identity and his mission. So what looks like a tragedy or a random unfortunate event to us is actually something that's being weaved together by God in his sovereign plan to demonstrate the glory of Christ. Jesus had a friend named Lazarus, but he was more than just like a casual acquaintance, like somebody at work or something. No, the Bible says Lazarus was he whom Jesus loved. Now you might be thinking, doesn't Jesus love everybody? Okay, listen, this is, this is like a very close friendship. This is the one whom Jesus loved. The Bible makes it, uh, uh, goes out of its way to tell us that. So, Lazarus fell ill, and Mary, the one who anointed Jesus' feet with her tears, that Mary, she sent to Jesus and told him, Lazarus, your friend, the one you love, is sick. But when Jesus heard it, he said something incredible. John chapter 11 and verse 4 says, he said this, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, I've noticed a theme especially when talking with atheists, they seem to think that human suffering is like the Achilles heel of Christianity. You guys know what uh, 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 an Achilles heel is? It's like... uh, That's why I walk on my toes. (laughs) That's why he walks on his toes, he says. Yeah. (laughs) She certainly could be. I I could see how that would work. An Achilles heel is something that's like your weakness. It's It's like the weak point that if you can hit it, you go down. So atheists think that human suffering is the Achilles heel of Christianity. And often, not long after, they quote Lex Luthor. That's right, the villain from Superman, who said this. This is what Lex Luthor said. He said, if God is all-powerful, he cannot be good. If God is good, he cannot be all-powerful. If anybody has seen the Superman movies, you, you would have remembered that line. And the logic is basically this. If evil and suffering exist then God doesn't. That's the line of of logic there. Now, this is narcissistic thinking, 
and it pervades Western culture because we think we are the most important people on earth. And surely, if we are the most important people, then God would never allow us to suffer if he truly loved us. But we do suffer, so therefore God doesn't exist. And what happens? We descend into hopelessness. And there is nothing more devastating to the human soul than the perception of meaningless suffering. I say it a lot, but it's true. The perception of meaningless suffering is devastating to to the human soul. But Jesus takes this perspective, and this is what he does. He takes Lex Luthor's perspective, and he turns it on its head, and he says, no, 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 our suffering has a purpose. God is weaving this mess together into a beautiful tapestry. It's for the glory of God to be seen through it. Yes, our suffering, in our suffering, the very glory of God shines through it. You might not like that answer, but it's true. That is what has sustained me in countless others through seasons of suffering. The truth that God's glory is somehow, someway seen through this. But how can that be? Well, look no further than the cross of Christ. Jesus is always the answer. Thank you for saying that, Ben, again. The most evil and unjust act ever committed was killing, murdering the Son of God. The only innocent one. The most unjust, evil thing ever. Now consider this. That thing, that event, was the very thing that God used to save us. You see that? The most unjust thing ever committed was the thing that God used to show his glory to you in the most profound way. His glory and grace is seen no more glorious than through the heinous act of the crucifixion. And of course, it's followed by the glorious resurrection, which is our great hope. So Jesus stays where he was for two more days. Then he decides to get up and go to Judea where Lazarus was. But his disciples pipe up and they say, like, Lord, look, they just... Remember in Judea, they just tried to kill you. Why are you going back there? You shouldn't go back there. They tried to kill you. You should lay low for a bit. Then Jesus says, no, there's 12 hours in the day. If anyone walks in the light, he does not stumble, but those who walk in the night stumble. What is he saying? He's saying, I'm the light of the world. Follow me. Like, just zip it and follow me. Walk in the light, and you won't stumble. And Jesus um, was actually about to lead them into a very grim situation. Verse 11 says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. But of course, the disciples didn't get it. You know, if he's just sleeping, he's, he's, he's fine. Just let him sleep. He'll recover. That's what they thought. So Jesus tells him plainly, oh, you guys are like really dull. He's dead. He's not, he's dead. I'm talking about his death. He's, he's dead. Then he says this, verse 15 And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. (laughs) Did you just catch that? Jesus just said he was glad. He's happy that he wasn't there. What appeared to be a tragedy was a tool in the master's hands to build faith in his disciples. And it still is to this day. When Jesus shows up, our most hopeless situations become our most faith-building situations because he is the resurrection and the life. What does resurrection imply? Something is dead. Something is hopeless. And he brings it back to life. Verse 17. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been dead in the tomb four days. Now when I read this passage, I, I did another thought Um, practice, I don't know, I thought about it. I said, can I imagine a more hopeless situation? And I thought, that's kind of hopeless, but that's more hopeless still. Well, that's a pretty hopeless situation, but this one's still pretty much more hopeless. And I really couldn't think of one. Jesus shows up to the most hopeless situation conceivable. Here's a man who's been dead for four whole days. Even Jesus was only dead for three days, (laughs) okay? This guy was dead for one more day. But Jesus waited four days on purpose. You see, the rabbis thought that the soul can kind of hang around you for up to three days after death. And so Jesus wanted it to be unmistakable to the Jews there 
This dude is dead, like for real. He stinketh. He, exactly, he stinketh. And he rose him from the dead because he's the resurrection and the life. So Jesus waits on purpose. He's setting this whole thing up on purpose so that it would be unmistakable that he is the resurrection and the life. So uh, Martha, Lazarus' sister, she went up to meet Jesus upon his arrival. And in verse 21, she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Like, Jesus, if you would have just been here sooner, you could have healed him. You know, how many times do we do this with the Lord? Oh, Lord, if you would have just did this, then this would have happened in, uh, in our omnipotent shows. <laughs> we think we know better than the Lord. But even she thought it was too late for her brother. Martha knew that whatever Jesus would ask of God, God would do, but even she thought, it's too late. Four days, Jesus, ah, if you just would have shown up like four days earlier, it would have been okay. But Jesus looks her square in the eyes and says, your brother will rise again. Pretty bold. Yes, Jesus, she says, at the resurrection of the dead, we all will rise. Yeah, I know, I, I believe that. But she didn't get it, so Jesus tells her in verse 25 to 26. Uh, here it is. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet, sh yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Martha believed. But nothing could prepare her for what Jesus was about to demonstrate. These were more than just words. Jesus was prepared to demonstrate that he is the resurrection and the life. Because Jesus knows talk is cheap. So Martha runs home and tells Mary, Jesus has arrived. And when all the Jews saw her get up and run out, they followed her thinking she was going to the tomb to weep and, you know, they wanted to support her or whatever. So when Mary got to Jesus, she fell at his feet weeping and, and like an echo, she just repeated her sister, if you were just here, you just would show up a little earlier, uh, Lazarus would still be alive. But then the Bible tells us in verse 33 to 34, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. So the infinite son of God looked around and he saw the weeping and he felt this pain, this grief in his own heart. He was deeply moved in his everlasting spirit and he was greatly troubled. If you could just imagine sort of what that'd be like, I mean, God being troubled if you ever lost anybody close to you, you know that grief is not a joke. You know it's not a joke. A C.S. Lewis wrote a series of journal entries after his wife died that was compiled into a book called A Grief Observed. If you haven't read this book, I really recommend it. Uh, it's a personal look into his grief. And as the reader, you get to just sit back at a safe distance and observe his grief and his pain. In the first lines of the, of the book, the first entry says this, he writes, no one ever told me that grief felt so like fear. I'm not afraid, but the sensation is like being afraid. The same fluttering in the stomach, the same restlessness, the yawning, I keep on swallowing. And he continues to say, it feels like being mildly drunk at times. And like having a mild concussion at other times. Grief elicits certain physical symptoms. It's as if some part of us has been ripped out and we just don't know how to get it back. This is why the Bible tells us that Jesus' spirit was greatly troubled. And let me just say this, that's really good news for the griever. Jesus experienced the same physical sensations we experience. He understands grief. In verse 35, or, yeah, verse 35 is the shortest but most profound verse in all the Bible perhaps. And all it says is this, Jesus wept. The God-man cried. But it's not like the image of, you know, that Native American looking over a garbage dump with like a little tear f going down his cheek, you know. No, it wasn't like that. It wasn't just a little tear like, oh, I'm sad. No, he wept. He, uh, the, Greek work, the Greek word is, uh, and I'm going to butcher its pronunciation, but uh, I'm going to try. Dakrio. It means to shed tears because of sadness, rage, or pain. 
I'm just going to venture to say that sadness, rage, and pain were all present in the weeping of Jesus. Sadness for the pain of his friends, rage at what sin had done to humanity, and that physical pain that accompanies grief. It was all present in the weeping of Jesus. And it was real, it was raw, it was intense. Now what other God do you know who weeps with his people, who enters into their suffering, who walks besides, beside them, who feels the pain they feel? What other God? He's truly the great hope we have. And although he knew Lazarus, look, he knew Lazarus was about to rise from the dead. He knew it. But he still entered into the suffering. He still did it. And some Jews who saw him weeping mocked. Well, he opened the eyes of the blind. Can't he save a man from dying? Like, come on, Jesus. Why are you weeping? Others were moved. They say, look at how he loved Lazarus. In times of grief, we can find ourselves in these two categories. Mockers. If Jesus is so great, why didn't he do something? Or believers, look at the great love Jesus has even in the midst of the suffering. In this scene of grief and pain, we have to be mindful that even in the pain, Jesus is moving forward. You see that? He said, take me to where he's buried. So he's not not grieving, but he's still moving forward in the grief so that he can be raised. That's why he's moving forward. And in our grief and pain, the resurrection and the life is moving us forward to our great hope, eternal life. Verses 38 to 40. (coughs) Excuse me. 38 to 40. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So Jesus gets to the tomb and is immediately deeply moved, overcome with the death of his friend and the mission he came to fulfill. Now remember, they just spent a good while walking and weeping together to get to this place. So now they get to the tomb and Jesus, visibly moved by the burial place of his friend, says, take away the stone." Sometimes we read the Bible and we kind of divorce it from reality. We've heard the story of the raising of Lazarus, some of us, many, many times, so we never get shocked by the words of Jesus anymore. So don't lose the shock factor here. And Jesus just told them to remove the stone. Now let me put it this way. You just lost, let's say, your brother. He passed away and his funeral was four days ago. Jesus says, bring me to his, where you laid him. So you go for a drive, you and Jesus and your family and your friends, and on the way you're weeping together, and and you pull into the cemetery, and you drive up to his tombstone, and you all get out, and Jesus, still visibly moved by the pain of of the death, he wipes his eyes of the tears, and he looks at you and says, go get a shovel and dig him up. That's shocking. Do you get it now? This is not a normal request to unearth your dead, buried loved one four days after the funeral. This is shocking. This is shocking stuff. So Martha, the sister of Lazarus, Lord, let me remind you, he's been dead four days and it's going to stink, frankly. (laughs) It's going to stinketh in the King James. The offense of opening a sealed tomb would only be amplified by the offense of the stench of the dead. But Jesus says in verse 40, I read it, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Martha, do you trust me? Do you believe my word? If you believe, you will see the glory of God in this stinking, rotting tomb. (laughs) So they took the risk, I suppose, and they opened the tomb. And Jesus lifted his eyes to heaven and he prayed like this. He said, Father, thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. Then stooping near the opening of the tomb, Jesus yells out, Lazarus, come out. Then to the shock and amazement of everyone present, he, 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 Lazarus, the stinking, rotting corpse, can't, comes out. His hands and his feet are still bound. His face is still wrapped with a burial cloth, but he's no longer rotting. He doesn't stink. He's healthy. 
He's whole. He's more alive than he's ever been. And the raising of Lazarus demonstrated with razor-thin precision that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He is the life giver. And at the sound of his voice, the dead come back to life. The scene of Lazarus' resurrection was a foreshadow. It's a little taste of heaven on earth. It's a picture of our salvation. We are Lazarus. Spiritually dead, stinking, buried, four days, hopeless. Look, we aren't sin sick. We are dead. Sin killed us spiritually. We don't need spiritual medicine. We need spiritual resurrection. That's why we pray. Some people say, well, if you believe that God, you know, does everything, then why pray? Because God does everything. Listen, a God who's not sovereign, a God who's not in control, can't help you. Why would you pray to a God who's not in control? All he could do is say, I'll try my best. No guarantees. No, no, no. He is the resurrection and the life. That's why we need spiritual resurrection. That's why when we pray for our lost family and friends, we should pray, Lord, resurrect their spirits. Lord, remove their hearts of stone. Give them a heart of flesh. Do the impossible, because only he can. You know that verse that we put on coffee mugs? Um, All things are possible with God. You know he's not talking about, like, losing 20 pounds, right? (laughs) You know, he's not talking about, like, you know, being a good athlete or something. The context of that scripture is they said, Lord, who can be saved? And Jesus says, with man it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. So at the sound of his voice, we come alive. At the sound of his voice, our spirits are ah, resurrected. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. Romans tells us that. What is the power of God? Is it not the resurrection? Is that not the power of God? Look, don't hear my voice. Hear his voice. Come out. Be raised, believe, have life. The same Jesus died to take away your sin. The life, listen to this. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. The life died. The resurrection laid in a tomb. But three days later, we know he who raised Lazarus raised himself. Now, here's the cool thing about Lazarus. He gets to be resurrected twice. (laughs) He heard his voice once, came out, but then he died again. So he's going to hear it twice. Jesus is going to raise him twice. He already knows what it is to hear the voice of the life giver in his tomb. The same voice we will hear if indeed we are in Christ. So hear Jesus now. Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? Believe. He's coming with resurrection and life for all who do. So many Jews who saw this believed, obviously, but some went out to the Pharisees and told on Jesus. They tattletailed. And so the, imagine tattletailing on, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Oh, man. Like, well, how do you tattle on someone like that? So the council gathered to determine what to do with Jesus, which is amazing to me. Um, here's what you do. Why don't you just believe? <laughs> you don't need to get a council together to figure this thing out. Anyways. They weren't interested in that. They were dead in sin, and so instead of standing in awe of Jesus, what do they do? They plot to kill him. He just raised someone from the dead. And you're going to try to kill him? You remember that scene in, I think it's the Dark Knight, when the guy is trying to bribe uh, Lucius, and he says, if, if you don't give me this money or whatever, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show all these plans of the Batman. And he goes, So here's what you're going to do. You're you're telling me you're going to bribe a guy who goes out at night, catches criminals, is a billionaire, and you're going to bribe that guy? And then the guy just goes, okay, and he leaves. Like, really? You're going to kill this guy? He just raised someone from the dead. What makes you think he can't do that to himself? Stupid. But there was a smart person in their midst, Caiaphas, He had some wisdom. He prophesied Jesus would die for the nation and and not just for Israel, but for all God's children all around the world. Even so, the rest of the council, they're like, oh, Caiaphas, whatever. Uh, They got together to plot to kill Jesus. And they told everyone that they knew where he was to tell them. This is the folly of sin. 
plotting to kill a man who obviously has authority over death. Sin makes us stupid. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Those who believe, though they die, they will live forever. Our passage started with the grim reality of Lazarus' death, but it ends with his resurrection in the high priest preaching the gospel to people who want to kill Jesus. He turns it around, man. Out of hopelessness and pain came resurrection and hope. The pain of suffering and grief is not to be downplayed. I'm not downplaying it here. If Jesus himself wept in grief, knowing Lazarus would soon be resurrection, resurrected, then, then, then we know that grief is something that we will experience. And if, if he did, so will we. But in the grief, in the pain, Jesus continues moving us forward, moving us forward to the tomb, moving us forward to death. The world fears, they dread that walk. Here's the thing, we're all walking there. Everyone is walking towards death. They dread it though. All, all, all life is a walk towards death, the inescapable end for us all. Walking that walk alone is terrifying. It causes men and women to faint from fear. But when we walk towards the tomb with Jesus, as the disciples and Mary and Martha did, it's a walk of hope. Because whether it's four days or 400 years, the hand of Jesus that lays us to rest will be the same hand that rises us back to life again. The, the, the hand that closes the eyes will be the one that opens them. When we experience suffering and grief, we must grieve, cry, yell, feel pain. Don't apologize for that. Jesus is walking the road of pain with you. He's weeping with you. He's feeling the same pain you're feeling. But just know this. If you believe, you will see the glory of God. Because in his timing, which isn't ours, he will demonstrate God's glory through the pain. He is the resurrection and the life. He is our hope. The good news is for you. So repent. Turn from your folly. Turn from your sin. Believe the good news and behold his glory in it. Let's pray together. Thank you so much for your word, Lord, your resurrection in your life. For those of us who are on the mountaintop, I celebrate with them. For those of us who are in the valley low, we weep with them. Whether we're in a good season or a bad season, Lord, we just trust you in it all. Resurrection in life, if there's anybody in this room who's not resurrected in their heart, I pray now that you would do that work in them. That you would raise them to belief, to faith, to walk with you. We trust you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.